Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to our, the third day of our FinTech online event series with Startup and Angel. Very, very happy to uh, welcome you uh, to this uh, concept. Uh, basically, today we've got a pretty packed agenda and hopefully we'll give you uh, you know, some additional knowledge and uh, really success stories to be inspired by, uh, as well as you know, new connection uh, and uh, so you can grow your network, you know, find new clients, hopefully meet some uh, investors if you're looking to fundraise. Uh, and uh, we uh, are very, very happy to have you know, a number of you joining us from um, all of APAC and, uh, and Europe, hopefully today. Um, basically, my name is uh, Leo Dennis. I'm the co-founder of Startup and Angels and uh, founder of Australians. Uh, powering uh, Startup and Angel for over five years now. Today, the event's gonna be uh, broken down into uh, three parts. Uh, you know, after this kind of short introduction, um, telling you who we are, what we do, uh, you know, and also uh, the numerous partners who are, you know, helping us with this initiative. Uh, we will uh, jump into a, a panel discussion moderated by uh, Pierre from uh, AirBA, uh, Xero Gold Champion based out of Singapore and, you know, pretty much assisting all over Asia Pacific with multiple offices. Um, and during this panel discussion, we really uh, dive into, uh, you know, the success factors of, you know, some amazing uh, fintech, uh, you know, including AirWallex, AgriDigital, uh, Xero uh, and BTO, uh, the new kid on the, on the, on the block. Um, and, um, you know, the, after this discussion, you know, you'll have the chance to actually uh, meet, uh, you know, a number of the, uh, the attendees, the speakers uh, and the partners uh, into small breakout room, uh, you know, so be with us, uh, you know, hopefully there'll be, uh, you know, some interesting contact and you'll be able to, you know, share your own stories and, you know, have, uh, you know, your call to action uh, in terms of, you know, how, how can you take this new connection and knowledge uh, to fuel your growth. Uh, so a little bit about Startup and Angel. Um, basically, you know, five over, just over five years ago, we had this vision of uh, creating a space uh, for early stage entrepreneurs, angel investors, and, you know, various technology players to meet. Uh, we've now done, you know, well over, you know, 65 uh, physical events, uh, you know, including a number uh, actually uh, co-organized with Pierre from RBA um, in Singapore, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia. Um, yeah, we, we had this unique opportunity to travel, you know, a number of startup ecosystem. And uh, since last year, we've created an online platform uh, for our members. Uh, you know, a number of you are already members. Some of you, you know, are very welcome to join this, uh, this community. Uh, you know, where you can kind of share your uh, wins, you know, PR, jobs, uh, you know, as well as, you know, obviously find, uh, you know, some investors, uh, clients, and, you know, uh, deals with your uh, technology partners. A um, few words about, you know, Australians, you know, who's been operating Startup and Angel for over five years. Basically, your, your vision is to create value through meaningful connection. Uh, you know, obviously, Australian's network, you know, organizing this type of event, uh, you know, it's, it's a right place for you to, you know, meet new people, uh, you know, with Australian's access, basically, we help uh, international scale-ups uh, and startups to uh, grow in new markets. And with Australian's talent, you know, we, that's our talent acquisition arm, we actually act as talent partner for, you know, a number of early stage SMEs. Uh, you know, and scale-ups to help them find the right um, or build the rockstar team. Um, once again, you know, organizing this type of events and being on, on, on this journey with Startup and Angel wouldn't be possible, you know, without the support of amazing partners, uh, such as, you know, OVH Cloud, uh, one of our platinum uh, partner for uh, just over two years now, um, gold partners like Aircall, uh, Fund Squire, uh, Old Shadwick, um, and Silver Partners, uh, you know, like the Salesforce App Exchange and uh, uh, Pledge One Percent. Uh, this event today, you know, is um, in partnership with 
uh, ABA uh, Zero uh, Gold Champion, as well as uh, World Pay. So now I will, uh, you know, uh, end over to uh, to Pierre, uh, you know, to uh, give him a chance to uh, say a few words about, you know, him and his mission, uh, as well as introducing our amazing panelists. Thank you very much, Leo. Uh, I am Pierre. Um, I am the managing partner of uh, RBA. Uh, we are uh, an accounting firm in, uh, in Singapore, Hong Kong, Vietnam, and Thailand. And I am also the co-owner of, uh, of an investment company, which is named um, uh, Rosemont Asia Investments. And we generally uh, invest in the digitalization of the accounting and, uh, and legal services industry uh, with uh, investment ranging from uh, 100 to, uh, to 500,000 uh, uh, dollars. Uh, we usually focus on this industry because this is the industry where we come from and this is the industry where we know, uh, that we know. So I will be moderating this panel. Uh, I have the chance to welcome four panelists. Uh, first, uh, Jeans, who is the CTO of uh, Agri Digital. Hello, Jeans. Hey, Pierre. Hey, everyone. Uh, then Laurent. Laurent is the CEO of uh, Better Trade Off. Hi, good to see you. Uh, Sam, Sam is the Chief Growth Officer at uh, Airwalex. Hi, Brian. And uh, finally, Ferdi. Ferdi is Director and uh, Head of uh, Sales for uh, Xero in Asia. Thanks, Pierre. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, then I'm I'm going to start uh, directly the panel. I'm going to start with you, Ferdi. Uh, uh, we see Ferdi. Sure. Yep. Yeah. So, Ferdi, I want to uh, to um, uh, first. I want to share with you that you know my usual job is the uh, in a, in a corporate services and accounting firm, uh, yep. and as such, we are using zero every day. Uh, I've been using zero almost every day for my own practice for my client okay. for roughly uh, nearly six years. And I have to say that I really, really love this solution. Um, uh, Xero is a tool that is very useful and we've seen how it developed and implemented over the year. And we've seen the, how it move from, uh, from a, a normal accounting software to more uh, uh, IE solution for, uh, for uh, startup SMEs and accountants. So my first question is uh, in your opinion, at this point in time, do you think Zero is still an accounting software, a SaaS, uh, an IE solution, or a fintech, or maybe all of the above, and why? Great question, Pierre, and glad to see that you are one of our customers and then one of the vivid customers as well. Yeah, so we are the, one again, of your gold champion. Of course, <laughs> <laughs> it extends everything. All right, so. That's a very good question. So for us, as all of you know, we are actually started as accounting software, but now we are all of the above. So our vision is to become the most insightful and trusted small businesses platform. And this is why we are investing in a couple of things. So the first is actually we want to drive cloud accounting adoption, and this is by increasing the penetration of small businesses, cloud accounting software. And then number two, we are also want to grow the small businesses platform. And this one by extending and, bring, and enriching Zero as a platform to help small businesses on their business as well. And the next thing is what we want to do. We want to build for global scale and innovation by preparing Zero to realize our aspiration to become the most insightful and trusted small business platform. So to answer your question, in short, we are everything, all of the above here. All and of the above. Why? Okay. All of the above, correct. And why we are all, all of the above? So a few things. First, Zero is more than just an accounting software. As a platform, we can help the SMEs and the startup to develop customized, scalable, end-to-end -end solutions for business, financial, and operations, like what you mentioned, Pierre. And also, we are also help to empower the small businesses by providing mm -hmm. them the right digital tools and solutions as well. And last but not least, we help to maintain a range of operational function, such as like a consumer, just a database, payments, invoicing, even when lockdown and restrictions require them to work remotely from home, for example. So, yep, that's why we are all yeah. of the above. 
Yeah, we're going to talk a bit more a bit more about the AI solution and the payments in in one of my questions. But it's true that uh, you really help a startup even to find uh, accountants because you have this directory uh, function as well. Uh, but you 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 first built a very successful brand in Australia and New Zealand. That's your that was your first market, and then after you launch in Asia. Um, what would you say were the key success in uh, building? brand and market share here in Asia? Yep, a couple of things. Again, we started from the humble beginning in New Zealand and then we are growing exponentially in Australia, like what you mentioned. And the next thing for us is actually to expand globally. So that's why we decided to come to Asia. And to answer your question, there are three key success. Um, not I'll, I won't say like a secret sauce, but some focus areas that we are looking at when we grow the business over here. So number one, no doubt, is to build a world-class team. So business won't grow, business won't fly off if we don't build a world-class team. And talent is a very important, very key for us. And the second thing is to, to build a strong channel with accounting firms and partners. So this is our bread and butter. And this strategy has been proven working very well in Australia and New Zealand. So that's why we bring it here, but obviously we localize as well. And the third thing is actually to build our brand and the right message in market. Because we are a big believer that different market, they have different dynamic, different characteristics. So we want to maintain our brand as a global brand, but at the same time, try to localize to fit with the local needs. So these are the three things that we look at here. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to go against any uh, any trade secret when I say that uh, Xero <laughs> is a listing entity, is a listed entity. Uh, so you've already went through the, the entire process, but starting from 2018, you have been uh, you have started to build stable and steady. I mean, to start a stable and steady acquisition process. Uh, does it mean that you you are progressively targeting AI solution or payment solution? And can you just let me know a bit more about this uh, your acquisition strategy? Yep. That's a very, another very good question. So again, like what you mentioned for us, yes, in line with our commitment to make lives better for our people in SME and also their advisors, we have acquired businesses that helps us to achieve that vision. So this is, has been one of our strategy to grow globally, which is to do M&A, Merchant Acquisition. And we completed nine acquisitions up to date. And I'll give you one example. So in March, last March, we acquired Plan Day. Plan Day is, is a startup, is a developer platform to help address the changing nature of work with employers and employees, increasingly adopting flexible arrangement and support. So we did this acquisition because we foresee that there will be more and more growth and then people are working remotely and then more and more business are becoming more flexible in workforce management. And also we see like the employees growing compliance burden by providing the tools they need to manage workforce flexibility and also the regulatory compliance. So this is the challenge, right? We want to have a balance between like giving the access to do to or to work remotely, but also comply with all of the regulatory. So that's why we see that this is the challenge that we face from our SMEs, partners, and the advisors. That's why we did the acquisition to help mm. them accurately calculating the, the wages, for example, and also to help them manage the workforce um, in more effective ways. So this is some of the strategy that we do to help achieve our aspiration. Great. Um, I have got one last question. Um, it's sure. how do you see the, the future for, uh, for Xero and for its uh, partners, so par like us, means um, other accounting firm that are using Xero? Yes, I always love to answer this question. So as all of you know, Zero has an important responsibility to meet the current and future needs of our customers. And we must do this by investing in product innovation and also customer experience. So to answer your question, Pierre, by using these priorities as our North Star, we reinvest the majority of our revenue back to the business. And this is something we are committed to doing this now and in the future. So for example, with the App Store, we want to make it easier for our customers to find digital solutions they need. That's why we launched Marketplace uh, earlier this year. And this App Store is one of the example for us making the whole user experience more cohesive. 
and also work with many independent third parties to solve different challenges as well. And we will also continue to evaluate the acquisition opportunities where they fit with our broader strategy and ambition to make lives better for people in SME and their advisors. And last but not least, we are always trying to get feedback from our customers, from our partners to understand what are the challenges, what are the opportunities that we have in order for us to build a better product and then improve all of the features that we have. So this is the things that we see the future for us, partners and our customers. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, so maybe more uh, acquisition in the fintech industry uh, from zero in the future? Potentially, yes, as long as it fits with our aspiration, definitely. We are very open for acquisition, okay. by the way. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ferdi. Um, Sam, <laughs> hello, Sam. Hey, Pierre. Uh, so Sam is the director of growth at, uh, at uh, Airwalex. So Sam, it happens that uh, but I also use Airwalex <laughs> <laughs> almost on daily basis. Yeah, we are one of your clients and, and um, I, I truly see the difference between your solution and, and more uh, traditional banking, not only in terms of cost simplification and uh, simplification of process, but also in, uh, in terms of uh, relationship uh, management. Airwalex really beats any uh, other uh, uh, traditional bank. Uh, I like the story too. Uh, I think it's a really, really, really entrepreneurial story. Uh, so if I read properly, your, your founder actually started uh, by opening a, a coffee shop in Melbourne. Melbourne, uh, this coffee shop now uh, became one of Australia's fastest growing unicorn because they realized how difficult it was and how painful it was to, uh, to process payment with, uh, with traditional banking. So they developed their own solution. So really entrepreneurial story. Uh, but maybe you can tell me more about uh, the idea behind, uh, behind uh, Airwalex. Yeah, for sure. And look, the... Um... Uh, I think the, the coffee coffee shop story is, is, is quite an interesting one. So I think Jack, Max, you know, and, and the co-founders at, at, at Airwallex, they never do things small. So they started one coffee shop, but the ambition was to open a global multinational franchise, right? They wanted to open a hundred, you know, hundred coffee shops around Australia and expand into Asia and that kind of thing. So when they started with that one coffee shop, um, you know, they weren't just looking to buy uh, coffee cups from, you know, the, the suppliers in Australia. They were looking for custom branded cups so that they, when they scaled to 100 shops, they would have, you know, a, a supply chain, you know, set up to, to support the, the volume. So I think it was very ambitious from, from the start, even, even with just one coffee shop. And, and I think the process of procuring those, those supplies from, from China you know, they really faced into the, the problems with the, the, the high fees, um, you, know, for, you know, poor foreign exchange, um, you know, so a lot of these challenges, which, which helped them realize actually there's a, a, a big opportunity here. Like the cafes are fun and, you know, like, but, but the problem is probably not as, as large as, you know, the one that Airwallex is now tackling. So, um, you know, that, that, that helped them, I think, identify, you know, there's a really large problem here for small businesses and, you know, and something that we can, we, we're, we're going to, I think we're uniquely positioned to tackle now. Yeah, definitely. Um, if you can tell me a bit more about uh, how Airwalex moved from the initial triple F investor uh, to now a series E uh, company over, uh, over the last few years. Yeah, for sure. I think like, um, you know, if you go back in time, our initial mission was, just to solve like one part of the financial services uh, pain point, which was the conversion of funds from different currencies and the transfer of those funds internationally. Okay. That's how we kind of started, right? It was a very much a collection, uh, sorry, a conversion and payment business. Um, I think our evolution over the last six years that we've been around, we've gone mm. from you know servicing just that one small pain uh, pain point to now trying uh, aspirationally to be the, the, the business bank or the, the, the modern business account um, for, for SMEs globally. Okay. So we want to now not just power the, the, the payments, um, but we also want to power issuing cards, you know, virtual cards, multiple users on the account, batch payments, you know, uh, API or, 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 or API based solutions. So I think the evolution of our product and the expansion of the product has helped us obviously you know, um, continue to scale, grow our revenue, but then also expand, um, you know, the, the, the investor base, you know, that, that, that we've been able to attract. I think we started with, with some local investors here in Australia, yeah. but you know, our, our last Series E um, was with uh, Lone Pine Capital in the US, um, given, we, you know, 
it was a strategic decision for us because we wanted to expand more aggressively. Yeah, that was my, uh, yeah, that was actually my follow up question is that um, very early you partner with, uh, with established investors like Gobi Partners, who is an early investor in Alibaba. Uh, and how this type of investments help you to, to build strong support? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they're very critical, right? Like who you partner with early, early on, they have a huge impact on your both the, the speed and scale at which you can grow, right? And um, you know, we were very lucky that uh, that you know, Gobi Partners and others, um, you know, gave us a lot of support. Um, for, for us, early on, it was about finding strategic investors uh, who can help us beyond just obviously providing the capital, but with connections and relationships into you know, the various, um, you know, problems that we needed to solve. So, you know, our business is, is based on, you know, a lot of strong partnerships with like banks around the world. And, and you know, and some of our strategic investors have been able to help us, you know, with introductions or, or you know, with, 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 with other, um, other type of support, um, you know, as well. So, you know, Lone Pine Capital is a great mm -hmm. example. Like we have our sites set on the US, a huge market, okay. and they're going to be helping us, you know, uh, we, we, you know get into that uh, market, you know, in, in a more aggressive way. Amazing. Uh, just a last question, last quick question regarding the technology, because I've seen there is this question in the comment as well. Uh, we usually confuse our wallets with some other payment services, um, let's say transfer wise, but you work a little bit differently, right? Instead of, uh, of using a bucket of money, you, you actually partner with local banks. Yeah. So, so I think like we, we are, um, I think quite different. Transfer wise or wise is, is, is you know, they, they've fundamentally started as a B2C offering. We're only a B2B offering, right? So we only deal with, uh, you know, business customers. That's our core yeah. mission and focus, which is why we can provide services like relationship managers, multi-users, you know, batch payments, a whole bunch of things, right? Um, for us, the relationship with our banking partners is critical. We partnered with 30 banks around the world. Um, okay. So, you know, uh, deep relationships now in that sector. And they help us, you know, identify new opportunities, um, you know, help us with, with the payments coverage, um, and then also reduce the cost of transfer. So we can send money, you know, around the world, you know, often instantly now um, and often fee free for, for customers. Right. So, um, you know, I think it, it is slightly different from, from transfer okay. with, with a really strong focus on the business sector. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, Laurent. Hi, Laurent. Can you hear me? Hi Pierre, sorry, I was looking for the button. Clicking is a bit okay. <laughs> yeah. Laurent, thanks for being here as well. Uh, so yeah. I've been also uh, following your company almost since its inception and I realized the, the first initial stage, the entrepreneurial mindset and what an, what an achievement since that with, uh, but can you maybe uh, introduce yourself and introduce maybe the BTO story Sure. What is BTO? What's, uh, what's, uh, what's better trade-off? So what does BTO stands for is better trade-off. And fundamentally, uh, what we do is in the name, uh, we help people achieve better outcome uh, by taking better decision. That sounds very uh, dry, but in reality, most of us want to have life, care about your family, care about your objective, care about uh, really uh, living a better life, the best life you can. And in most cases, the problem is, but what does it mean in terms of my finance and what our finance can help me? Okay, that was where we started the company, and realizing that even if you're the kind of a one of top pride bank, it's difficult to get what you want, and uh, needless to say, difficult to uh, scale this value proposition to everybody. So we started there uh, with a with a mission, and uh, it took us three years because the tech was not that easy. I mean, we are not the first one to try; <laughs> we didn't want to be the last one to fail. Uh, so <laughs> we, we did take the time to uh, to get there. Let's put it this way, and. Uh, very happy to, uh, to have been uh, supported by my co-founders and, and a bunch of really bright people. And then uh, contrary to uh, most people, we decide not to go on B2C, even if your solution is at the end of the day for consumer, but really uh, embrace the B2B2C model because uh, we felt that if our mission is to bring the solution to as many people as possible, uh, we'd probably uh, be better served by doing it through partners. And so uh, our business is B2B, even if we uh, help our consumer directly. Um, that's how it started. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah I, uh, I remember that you, your investor seems to be uh, very targeted. They can be... Uh, they can be from your industry, from the finance industry, bank, insurance. Uh, it seems that you are looking more for partners than, than investors. Actually, I feel that your uh, 
your investor can also be your clients. <laughs> so both true on, on both accounts. So uh, when we looked at the investors, we, we took a, a different path than many, uh, and we'll see if, uh, if we were right on this one. Just <laughs> out. But fundamentally, we, we said we, we looked at our investors as opportunities to um, broaden our understanding of the market, broaden access to uh, people, resource, technology, and, and also uh, give us uh, being motivated by helping us be successful. Because what we're doing is something that many have tried, but we're basically a, a category disruptor. We uh, we're an enabler. So where you provide advice is uh, thanks to our solution, much easier, also much more powerful and much more credible. So it helps everybody. But if you want to do something like that, you need to have people who can help you um, to uh, to really quickly get access to the resource you need and get access to a place where you can test this. And so yeah. that's another place for invested time. So now they were investors. They are investors, they're taking risks, they're also uh, sharing the reward. But uh, needless to say, yes, we were very, uh, our approach was slightly different from what you would do with an uh, anchor investor. That being said, because we have now launched with major clients and uh, the growth is accelerating, we're getting back to a more classical mechanism. And that's the uh, next phase. Okay. Yeah, no. Um, uh... I remember also the, 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 the first step of your company, and, and I really remember the, the startup employee mindset. Uh, you, you were at the be very beginning, you were considering employee like partner, probably also the, the other one, but your company is the one I, I, I know the most. Um, uh, uh, but you, you were since the beginning offering a perk like unlimited paid leave and, uh, and, uh, and all this, uh, this solution that seven, eight years ago were not that uh, common in the, in the market. Um, but how do you uh, involve your employees so they, so they remain on board? So I think it, it boils down to how you see uh, a company and how you see people working with you and, and your right partner is a, is a place. We think that everyone is building the business and the way we recruit people and the way we look for people joining us is how do we make sure that they bring themselves with all their ideas and how do we make sure that we treat them with uh, both respect and, and with optimism in the sense that mm. I've seen people develop. Uh, it's never fun when you have Google uh, pushing out one of the guys, <laughs> uh, but it's always a good sign because you, you know that you have done the right thing in terms of recruiting and motivating. And for us at the end of the day, it, it's very easy to talk about people are the most important resource in our company. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have to walk the talk. And, and I think if you treat people with respect and, and dignity and and trust them to do the right thing, uh, those incentives become very natural. And in fact, uh, it's quite proven and we have seen it. Uh, there is very little abuse to be uh, very honest. I have not seen it in uh, so many years. And, and I believe that there's been quite a fair amount of ability to attract and also retain people, but most importantly, motivate people in the right manner. I think that's really what makes yeah. a difference. And that's why we are so scalable at the end. And same question than the other one. Uh, so what's the future for uh, BTO and uh, what's the next step? So right now, it's uh, we just doubled the pipeline of our clients in three months <laughs> on the enterprise, <laughs> which is like, wow, <laughs> that, when you are successful with your clients, uh, that's probably the best advertisement you can make. But for us, it's so is that uh, in addition to Asia and, and we kickstarted Europe, uh, is the entry in the US. So now is the uh, next fund uh, raising, which is uh, in a much larger scale. Uh, we still have a bridge to uh, allow us to uh, give ourselves time to find the right partner. We're also very selective on, the, on this approach. Uh, but the future for us is really about growing as fast as we can and continually developing the solution because it's never been designed to be to do everything for everybody. We try to be best in class in what we do, which is convincing people to do the right thing for the finance. And then we partner with other companies who can bring the solution. And it can be investment, it can be uh, property, it can be uh, insurance, it can be loan, uh, any aspect of your life which has financial impact. So that's where we see the future and it's bright and it's interesting and tiring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fantastic. Thank you, Laurent. Uh... Next panelist is uh, Jeans from uh, Agri Digital. Hello, Jeans. Can you? Uh, hey, Pierre. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Uh, Jeans, can you uh, please introduce yourself and, uh, and introduce also Agri Digital? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Jeans. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Agri Digital. Um, most of you probably haven't heard of Agri Digital before, and we've sort of been a silent 
uh, tech company growing in the background. Um, so what, what does AgriDigital do? Uh, we actually technically build uh, technology services across the entire agricultural supply chain, um, and we're rebuilding that infrastructure underneath it all. Uh, we sort of cross both technology and fintech uh, because one of the things we just do is not only build and digitize the inventory and the entire agricultural supply chain, uh, we connect uh, local and international uh, growers with buyers um, and, and, and consumers. And we uh, also provide commodity backed asset finance um, at record speeds uh, within like 24 hours compared to a bank. So we kind of do a bit of technology, traditional technology sort of supply chain work, but we also play in the finance and financial services side. Yeah, you're actually a, a, a unique player because you're, you're really um, uh, built and try to implement a, a digital solution in an industry which is very traditional and, uh, and uh, you're a mix between a supply chain company and also a blockchain company. So, so uh, what really triggered this step to go in such a, a traditional non-digitalized industry and try to, uh, to implement a really uh, high-end digital solution? Yeah, so if you think about it, like farming and agriculture uh, is one of the oldest, if not the oldest um, industries Industry. in the world. And yeah, you're right, there's, there's a lot of uh, non-technology adoption there. Um, but surprisingly, there's also a lot of technology adoption in, in terms of like hardware and uh, machinery and, and trying to improve that. Um, agriculture is not changing. It's going to be, uh, it's going to exist for the, for the long term. Um, and in fact, grain agriculture is, is one of the hardest things to don't, not just manage, but ensure that we have food supplies for the rest of the world. Um, mm. What we found was quite interesting um, that out of the, all the countries in the world, only five countries um, control about 90% of the grain um, market globally. Oh. And even within that, nine, no, in the, within that five countries, 95% of uh, players or 95% of the transaction volumes, uh, both grain and financial, are actually only managed by 2% of the actual players. So there's a huge disproportionate swing against uh, consumers and also uh, the, the farmer. So uh, as you sort of go older and older and older and years, years go on, um, the small farm is just moving away. And as a result, it's, uh, it's actually hurting a lot of families. It's uh, making it a, a, lot, a, a lot more expensive uh, to ensure that food supplies are available. Um, and we wanted to build infrastructure that allowed the small player, um, just like Airwallex and um, Zero are doing for the small businesses, um, to participate and not just participate, but to compete against the bigger players. Um, and that's what we're really doing. Okay, yeah. Um, now talking about investment, because that's one of the matter, uh, can you explain your investment process, the, the investment process that you've been through and how the funds are, are used, currently used towards the improvement of your technology? Yeah, yeah, you specifically talking about the, the finance services side that we, we offer? Yeah. Yeah, so interestingly, um, because we transact all the grain asset and commodity across our platform from the start all the way to the end, uh, we know who owns what grain. We, we literally know which farmer owns it and where it goes and how much is being moved between the various participants. Um, as a result of knowing who owns that asset, that asset actually has a, vol uh, has, has a value. If you think of it like a, a fashion store or a, a, a fashion house, um, a store could have inventory sitting on their warehouse or even inside their store, um, and that's got value of some sort. Um, unfortunately, traditional banks don't see that with, uh, with, um, with farms. So they don't provide finances or loans to these farmers um, or anyone in that supply chain based off the asset value. So what we actually do is uh, we lend directly against the asset value itself. And we don't do any traditional credit checks. We don't do uh, financial checks across the bank or the individual. There's mm. no securitization of personal assets. Um, what actually happens is we can see the asset in real time. We have various monitors and sensors out in the field through IoT devices. And we can instantly know if something exists um, or not. And not just that, we can see it, we can monitor it, we can check the quality and the grade. Um, and we can say, hey, Farmer Joe, we know that you have 100 tons of wheat sitting right there in your, in your storage. Um, here's half a, thousand, half a million dollars of cash right now for you to use as cash flow. And we then take ownership of that grain. 
and we on sell it down the uh, down the track as well. Um, so we actually provide instant loans across the supply chain based off the asset itself. Yeah, that's that's interesting because you mentioned other industry, and that was my last question: is what's the future for your technology, and can it be implemented in other industries? Yeah, certainly. So I guess the immediate future is um, we just launched in the United States at the end of last year, um, and we're looking to grow that quite substantially. Um, we're looking to grow into the other uh, three mar big markets as well, Asia and the and Europe, um, and really p dominate that entire um, grain agricultural supply chain. Um, the technology that we've built, yeah, it is 100% usable across any other agricultural supply chain, uh, whether that be livestock or anything else. So that would be something that we would look into as well. Okay, thanks. So I have only two more minutes. Um, I'm going to ask one of you very briefly uh, if you can uh, give maybe a final tips for entrepreneurs that are listening or for early investors that are here. Uh, maybe I, I'm going to start with you, Jeans, since you're on the screen. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, th I think um, my number one tip that I always say to not just my team, but anyone that comes to me is um, go talk to the customer, like the customer and understand what, what the real problem is that they're trying to solve. Um, don't think face value that what they tell you is the problem, but really understand the why. Well, why do they care? Uh, Bertrand? I think at the end is um, for us on the product side, it's all about customer experience and uh, complexity and uncertainty is enemy of action. And so for us, when we make it simple, but, but we don't compromise how powerful it is, that's mm -hmm. where we see people taking action. Every one of us want a better life. We all know we need to do something about it. The question is, how much do I need? What can I do? And uh, what if things go wrong? And why should I trust you? If you solve that, it's very simple. People do act and uh, everybody wins. So more important to convince your customer than your uh, investors. I think the investor, when they see, the <laughs> they are also consumers. <laughs> and when they want yeah, that's to true. And, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. and for you, Sam? I think um, uh, like iterating very quickly is, I think, also really important. When we started, we started with an invoicing product. Um, and you look at where we are today, it's very different to the initial concept of the product that we had, right? So mm. I think a lot of iteration over the last six years to kind of get different things out in market and, you know, hear that feedback from customers. Okay. And you, Ferdi, beside uh, choosing a good accountant, what would be your, uh, your, uh, <laughs> <laughs> your advice for, um, for yeah. startups? SMEs. Yeah. That's the that's the best and first advice. Choose the good accountants. Mm -hmm. So in in serious note, one thing that we are doing in in our company in zero is actually number one, make sure that you understand the problem statement well, because if you don't understand the problem statement well, you can't draw a good hypothesis. So make sure that you have a good hypothesis to test, and then never afraid to do test and learn. And I agree with everyone over here. So we need to make sure that we place the big bet well and always keep learning. So these are the things that we always do in zero in order to always innovate and grow the business. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm going to so throw the, this event back to Leo now and uh, see you in the, bre in the breakout room later. Thank you so much, Pierre. Everyone, uh, a big, big thank you and a round of applause uh, for this amazing, amazing discussion. Uh, a number of uh, you know great tips. So thanks all for you know sharing your uh, your knowledge and your journey with us today. Uh, was very you know very instructive. You know got you know number of gold nuggets and uh, I can't wait to you know continue the discussion um, in the in the breakout room. Uh, so very uh, you know. A big thanks again to you know Pierre from uh, RBA uh, in Singapore, uh, Sam uh, from Airwalex in um, in Melbourne actually I think today. Uh, Jeans, where, where are you based actually, Jeans? Uh, in Sydney. Sydney. Uh, lucky you, not too far from me I guess. Uh, in lockdown as well, uh, Laurent, uh, better trade off. Um, can't wait to use your uh, your solution and make the right decision. Uh, and uh, Laurent was from uh, Singapore and uh, Ferdi uh, from Zero, head of Asia uh, for Xero, uh, based in Singapore as well. 
uh, thanks so much for you know making the time and uh, uh, really happy you know also for our participants to have the opportunity to network with you uh, uh, shortly. Uh, you know, we, we put in the chat a link to uh, join uh, the community, Startup and Angel. Uh, it's free for, um, you know, founders, advisors, investors, um, you know, join us if you haven't already done so. So you can uh, continue to access, you know, this type of uh, online events uh, for free and, you know, as well kind of grow your, grow your network. Uh, our next event is going to be in uh, just under a month, uh, you know, really kind of focusing on um, promising early stage uh, Australian fintech startups um, at 4.30, um, you know, we would be part of the Spark Festival, which is probably one has become you now the, the largest national uh, startup uh, and innovation festival in Australia. Uh, we've been part of this festival uh, since inception, actually, I think it's actually started in uh, 2016. Uh, so watch this, uh, watch this space. Uh, we're still onboarding actually, you know, founders. Uh, we, we already have uh, probably three out of four of the, of the companies presenting, but like, you know, if you feel like it's the right time for you to actually showcase uh, your startup, uh, contact us, um, contact me or, or my team. Um, and uh, so right now, uh, as you get allocated in uh, meeting rooms, uh, I mean, you'll get the opportunity to actually turn your camera on and your, and your mic uh, and join the discussion. Uh, each room will be uh, facilitated by a moderator. Uh, and, uh, you know, you get a chance to, you know, introduce yourself, tell us what you're working on and how we can help. Uh, so big, big thanks uh, to my team as well. Um, Florencia, Sophie, Vivenshi, uh, Axel, uh, and, you know, the extended kind of Australian team and a big thanks to, you know, all our partners, um, you know, Found Square, especially Brendan uh, and Joel in, in the room, they've been quite instrumental uh, putting this uh, event series together. Uh, Salesforce App Exchange, uh, you know, Sylvia joining from uh, London today, uh, Chris and uh, Stuart who spoke on day one. Uh, WorldPay, um, who's done a you know great job supporting us, and you know we had the really like a, the great chance to have their uh, VP uh, of partnership uh, based out of London, Michaela, uh, taking part to the panel on day one. All the content's gonna be available uh, pretty shortly, uh, you know, online. So you know if you missed a day, uh, or you know you really want to listen again to uh, to the tips. Um, from some of our speakers today, you know, you'll be able to kind of replay that. Um, it's Leo, I'll see you in my room. A uh, big thanks everyone. And, you know, make the most of the, of the networking session. Today, we live in an exciting data revolution where technology is rapidly changing the way we work and live. At OVH Cloud, we are at the forefront of this digital shift as a leading global cloud provider and the number one cloud solution in Europe, serving customers worldwide. We are independent and vertically integrated with our data centers across our own fiber optic network, bringing businesses everywhere a secure and efficient alternative to the other cloud hyperscalers with complete respect for data protection. And just how are we different from the tech giants? Here are four key advantages. Our history is grounded in developing innovative efficiencies with a clear vision for a more sustainable future. We own the full value chain and we manage the product life cycle. With our vibrant ecosystem of partners, customers, and our common goals, we offer a complete portfolio of cloud solutions in total compliance to industry and open source standards. And as an ecosystem, we are driven by purpose, united by common product values. Together, we are change makers. Building the future of technology for all, 